All right, we're back, people, and we're going live. It's the classic duo, movie nerd and TV nerd, back together, doing a what I like to call a talking TV classic in the sense of where this is one of the first things that we kind of started doing and, like, really nerding out about. It's back. The cultural phenomenon that is Cobra Kai is back for its fifth season. Chris, you ready to get into this? Oh, man. I mean... I cannot wait, dude. It's been a long time since we've done a pod together. It's been a little while since we've had some Cobra Kai. So yeah, dude, let's uh, let, let's hit let's hit this one. All of that and more on today's episode of the Talking TV Pod. Oh, man. Chris, first of all, good to have you back, dude. It's been a minute. It's been so long. I keep worrying that it's like every time I see you, is it's like, when am I going to see him next? But hopefully this will be the beginning of us getting back to a slightly consistent podcast trend. First of all, before we get started, how have you been, man? What have you been up to in your life? You know, we've, we've been up to a lot of different stuff going on. I just wanted to catch up real quick. Sure. Totally, man. Likewise, likewise. Um, yes, I'm, I'm really hoping that this is the start of a return to form. Um not only for myself on the podcast, um, we'll, we'll see if uh, Cobra Kai can return to form because after watching two episodes, I might not be the fan or the over as over the moon as I might have been in previous years. Not to say I'm fully out, but I'm also not as fully immersed as I usually am when it comes to this show. But as far as life goes, um, what can I say? Uh, finishing up school, the final semester, um, the uh, quote unquote real world is just around the corner. We'll see what that means. And yeah, just 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 doing an internship at a paper, doing journalism. want nice. to thank Joe uh, from Guy at the Movies for uh, giving me a shot at writing some articles um, early on, I actually think I learned a lot more from contributing to his blog than I thought I would have. Uh, it's 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 not to say it's given me all the answers to my internship, but there is a certain workflow that I think I learned. Um, almost wanting to gouge my eyeballs out writing a few reviews on the Halo series. So yeah, <laughs> but what about you, man? We've never seen you in this location before. Yeah, I was about to say, you're probably, you guys are probably wondering, new studio, new setup. I've officially moved. I'm no longer in upstate New York. I have now officially reconvened. I am in Brooklyn. I'm finally in the heart of it. I am in New York, New York. It is official because in order to clue you guys in on something, I ended up somehow winning a scholarship and I am going to acting school. So for the, for the foreseeable future, you guys will be hearing my voice as I am also, you know, taking acting classes. And I'll be sure to keep you guys updated in the loop as far as that goes. But Chris, it's been a weird summer to say the least, you know, where the, the summer box office was kind of officially back after the weirdness of 2021. But it, it, it just, for, for lack of a better word, it wasn't even just that like the movies weren't up to stuff. It just felt like there weren't that many movies. It felt like there were five movies overall that, um, what's it called? It felt like there were five movies that were, what's it called? It felt like there were five movies that came out the entire summer in general. You know, like, it's like, it was Top Gun, Multiverse of Madness, Minions, Thor, Nope, and most recently Bullet Train. And it just felt like the content well has dried up so much to the point where it's like, okay, so people are starting to come out in droves. People are starting to come people are starting to come out um and actually start to go and see movies in theaters again but the biggest thing for me before we get into cobra kai itself is just that because i would just wanted to take on this because we haven't had a chance to uh talk about it as much is just 2022 in general man we're eight months in almost practically nine now and like what do you make it of this just very strange year for content so far well, it's funny. I think it kind of goes along to a little bit of our pre-stream conversation. Um, if I can uh, let the listeners in on that for a second, you kind of pitched an idea, a way to dissect this year in television and film, if you will, that is is obvious, but you got to think about it to get to that conclusion. And it, it, it does tie into Cobra Kai, which is why I bring this little tidbit up. You basically said something along the lines of, we're getting to a point where some shows we've been watching for a long time, like mainstays are, are, are they starting to overstay their welcome? Should they start coming to an end? Is the excitement level 
not there as much as it had used to be. And I got to say, I think I kind of feel that sentiment, right? We had kicked around along with Cobra Kai, which we'll get into in a few minutes here. What we do in the shadows is another contender for that. Maybe they should start wrapping this thing up sooner than later. Well, um, I, I can tell you right now, that's not happening. They already renewed that show for two more seasons. Right. And it's again, it's one of those things where I think the critics align differently with the audience members, because I think that that show's only growing in popularity. And I personally don't even think it's like hit its big mainstream stride yet. It's it's just it seems to be slowly growing more in a cult following with each season. But but to not get too far from the point, I think we are in kind of like a weird restart time. As much as I loved this last season of Stranger Things, I, I, I simultaneously felt like it was one of the most exciting and most boring seasons of television in the longest time. And I think a lot of the reasons why I thought it was exciting was not just because I, I love playing, you know, my fair share of Dungeons and Dragons, and I think they always honor that medium well, uh, one of uh, the classic tabletop storytelling mediums, but I just think it's like, was it the zeitgeist that pulled me in and got me so excited? Was it actually that good? And yeah, it was. It was It was good, but I, I just, I don't know. I think if, as much as I love Stranger Things, if it ended tomorrow, if they said, hey, no final season, we're kind of done, okay. I think that's cool because I don't want you to poison the well, if you will. Like it's it's of a certain level right now. But if we keep going, will we dilute it? And I feel like that's a lot of what's happening, because on the flip side of the coin, to answer your question this year, there's so many new shows that I'm loving and I just can't wait to get more of. Um, uh, first of all. Slough House, uh, what's the Slow Horses? Slow Horses, yeah, phenomenal. Um, that HBO show, which the name is escaping me, but it's the American detective living in Japan. Absolutely incredible. Tokyo Vice. Tokyo Vice, incredible. Yeah, Cannot wait a for shift. Yeah, can't wait for more of that. And I wonder, and I'm going to turn it over to you here, Dom. I just wonder if this is the nature of the beast, right? Do we just are we just so trained from social media, from this digital age of now, 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 that we are losing our patience and our tolerance for even top tier TV that runs too long, or, or, or is this just that some of these shows we love, maybe like the aforementioned Cobra Kai, are kind of starting to run their course? What's your take on all this, man? I'll tell you exactly what it is because this is something that we've been seeing since time of memoriam and TV. It's just a matter of again because of the nature of the beast, because of the age of social media, because of the lower attention spans. It just happens so much quicker. We're in a shift, is what we're in. Again, a lot of these shows that we've been watching, a lot of them have which started or either gained popularity during the pandemic, or some of which that we've even been following before the pandemic that got delayed and we're only just now catching up on. Those are the shows that are starting to come to an end. We're seeing this outcropping of new shows start to pop up. The other thing as well, in addition to it being a shift and kind of, you know, now that we're coming out of the digital age, we're coming out of the age of streaming, you know, studios, which were, uh, sorry, Wall Street, which was all hampering down on studios to go all in and streaming during the pandemic. They're all now, of course, pulling out because Wall Street is realizing, hey, you know, the long term effects of streaming uh, minus the pandemic are not a great idea because surprise, surprise, nobody wants to sit at home streaming after sitting locked in their houses for two straight years. So they're like, follow the money, get everything back in theater, start making money. You're seeing Warner Brothers with their merger with Discovery make some crazy decisions behind the scenes, axing a whole movie for tax returns. That was like a just crazy news story with how people reacted to that in general. But as far as the TV thing goes, yeah, like I said, a lot of these streamers as well are going through a lot of behind the scenes shifts. You know, Disney is just continuously screwing up as far as the amount of content that they're putting out. Netflix is in a weird spot as far as, um, what's it called as far as their, uh, you know, just their, their stock prices and with their pricing and the things they're prioritizing now, you know, we talk is obviously in the air that they're going to introduce an ad tier. And as far as the shows themselves, yeah, like I said, a lot of the shows that we've loved, that we kind of fell in love with and have been watching during the pandemic, you know, your Cobra Kai's or what we do in the shadows, your for all mankind's, all of them are hitting their like, you know, their middle of the road tenure and where he is before that would have been like right when they're starting to amp up now in the social media age, they're kind of at the period of where it's like, okay, three seasons. Like, do we really need to go more than that? You know, four seasons. Do we really need to go more than that? And like, obviously, yeah, us as like television traditionalists, obviously we're used to that, but we also still remember the time of where it's like, yeah, but we remember that usually shows that went this long. That's where things started to go wrong. You know, very, very rarely are shows able to hit and maintain that level of consistency throughout that long period of time. And now, just in the social media age, I don't know how many times I'm going to be able to say that, but 
things have just become so fast tracked. And it's like, we are so used to, we're used to getting like two seasons of a television show and it being like done, you know, like obviously we were, we're still mad at Netflix for glow, but like that was only going to get one more season. That was only going to get like four seasons. And then it was done. You know, Ozark, the Ozark made the, I thought the very fatal mistake of splitting its last season into two parts. And I thought that crippled it because where it is, the first part was great and could have wrapped everything up there the last seven episodes just like completely dragged it down and torched it so that's just kind of my take on it it's just a matter of kind of the same thing that has been happening in television since time of memoriam just at an accelerated pace because of social media and the tech age yeah yeah you nailed it and i think one last thing to um just one last point to raise before we move into uh our our more specific thoughts on cobra kai here it's something you've said time and time again on the show and something I've learned doing this podcast. The English, now I think I'm more a fan of the American style of storytelling, but when it comes to the presentation of the story and giving the story just enough life without overcooking it, the English know exactly how to do it. I mean, those quick seasons in and out, again, like I said, not not necessarily always resonating with me, but I gotta say, I gotta say, there's not much fat to be trimmed, if any, from uh, the ever-growing list of English series that I've now watched. And something, there's something there, you know. There's something. I, there. I would also I heavily recommend if you haven't got a chance to look at uh, to watch it, The Outlaws on Amazon, starring Christopher Walken, already in the top ten list. One of my favorite shows of this year, created by Stephen Merchant, who's the co-creator of The British Office and a bunch of other great shows, worked with Ricky Gervais for years. He's the super tall dude that's in all of Ricky Gervais's stuff, and he's absolutely hilarious, just absolutely uh, in love with it. I, I had an absolute blast. It's great. I couldn't recommend it more. All I'll say is, the less you know going into that show, the better. It's 12 episodes, two seasons, six episodes each, and it's just absolutely perfect. So, Chris... You ready to get into Cobra Kai? We again, th- th- I call this one a Dom and Chris special because, like I said, when we first started this podcast, you know, we were getting into year two. Like I said, we were pretty much exclusively covering movies for the first year back in 2019. And then the second year, once movies went away, we started watching all these TV shows. You know, we did a- our sect on Community, we did our sect on Avatar The Last Airbender. You got me into Ted Lasso. And then, you know, Cobra Kai, you know, that that was when 2020 was the year that it kind of made its big comeback after YouTube pulled the plug on it. And then Netflix swooped in, picked it up, and it turned into a cultural international phenomenon. You know, we covered, we had a lot of fun on the show covering it. You know, season three and four bookended 2021, and it really made up for an otherwise pretty lackluster year. We even had like an interview of Jeff Bryan from Survivor, who was obviously a background character in the, fir- in the original Karate Kid movie. You know, Co- Cobra Kai, man, it's had... It's had such an interesting and crazy legacy, you know, starting out as one of many things that was kind of a joke on How I Met Your Mother that ended up becoming like one of our most watched shows. It's crazy. Two of the most watched shows of the last couple of years, Better Call Saul and Cobra Kai, both still originated as jokes on different shows. So I don't know. I don't know what that says about like kind of the state of what could make great TV. But. We find our characters picking up after the events of season four, kind of in a precarious position. You know, they're all kind of down on their luck. You know, they lost the tournament. Terry Silver is now reigning supreme. John Kreese is in jail. He's opening up Cobra Kai dojos all over the place. Um, Zabka's pulled back. He's trying to, you know, be more of a calm, cool collective, you know, cool dad, for lack of a better word. Daniel is once again hell-bent on trying to stop Silver, this time having brought in his good friend Chosen in order to help him. And things are definitely... Again, it goes into our conversation that we were having before where it's like we're getting to the point now where it's like, okay, we know what we're going to get. We know we're kind of familiar with the Cobra Kai formula. You know, we're used to like every episode is going to have like a motivational speech in it, you know, with with one karate action sequence and stuff. And, And now it's like, I don't know. I feel like kind of the residual corniness and silliness that we loved in the last couple seasons, I feel like they're taking more of a slightly serious tone this time. So I don't know. I just feel like some of that fun is not there. And it's that thing that always happens with comedies. This happened in every single comedy that I've ever seen where they have a great consistent tone that they're doing. And then they try to camp, clamp it down and make the characters more serious and mature. And the magic is just lost. It happened with Brooklyn nine, nine. It's happened with almost every single sitcom that I've ever watched. And it started to happen here. Chris, you do. Are your thought processes the same? Yeah, no, I think you're, Really spot on this morning. I got to say, um, just so people know where I'm coming at it, I think you said you watched six episodes. Yeah. I've watched two so far. And I think they're not, there's nothing wrong with them. Okay. They're, they're, they're still well written. It's the same level of quality. It still has that like CW feel if maybe they got an extra $2 million. Okay, cool. We'll take it. Right. And that's what you want, I think. And that's why I think, 
while I understand the maturity, while we know the process of working on a TV show, we, we know what happens when there's a bunch of mainstays that are creatively connected on and off the screen, you grow, you develop, and you are able to push the envelope more. So it makes sense that there's a maturity, but I kind of feel we needed more as I look back, and this is hilarious to say because if you guys go and watch our old podcast, I wasn't really a fan of this specific moment I'm going to reference. But as I look back now, right, hindsight is twenty twenty. I feel like we need more breaking into a zoo and less like... <laughs> Unless, like, Johnny um, <laughs> on a road trip with his son trying to be the father figure he never was, trying oh, to you right mean wrong. Oh, you mean breaking into a fr- breaking into the house and starting a full-on fight club just out of nowhere? Like, you mean more moments like that? Having a fight in the middle? Yeah. Having, having a freaking a t- rumble in the Bronx massive fight that sprawls across the entire school? Moments like that? We need more stuff like that. Like, and less of this, like... <laughs> I just want what's best for you, and I'm actually going to make the right decision as an adult because because yeah, we're in season this. five now, and I guess like we're in season five now, so I put the flask down. I don't know, like what's up with that? It's kind of not I what I know. want. Yeah, I don't know. Like I said, it's always that period where it's like again the reasons why we fell in love with the show. It always differs from like kind of where the show wants to go as it grows, as it evolves, as it continues. It's always kind of a tricky balancing act, you know. It's like and, and I feel like that a lot of TV shows, specifically comedies, you know, dramas. I feel like usually most of the time don't have this problem, but with because dramas are always about growing and evolving and changing their characters from the beginning, you know. But it's always that problem that comedies have, where it's like their characters are sucking in that one position and we love them for that, but naturally they want to make their characters grow and change and evolve but it's like they're naturally inherently not going to be able to you know keep that silliness that goofiness that charm continuing you know they always kind of run out you know modern family had it brooklyn 99 had it i think the only comedies for me at least the ones that like are really able to maintain that consistent tone throughout the end of the ones that like it takes a couple seasons for you to get into it you know that's just my take at least like my whole thing with parks and rec that i talk about all the time is it's like those first two seasons for me were painful you know or at least the first season and a half then season Second half of season two, they started to find their stride. And then season three, they were ready to go. And they were able to kind of maintain that consistency and that tone throughout the last couple of seasons. So, like, what do you think it is, like, about, like, comedies as far as, like, when they can hit their tone immediately, but then they start to fizzle out versus, like, they take a little bit in order to find their stride. Then they really nail it, you know? Like, is that just, like, kind of nature of the beast? Or is it is it a thing that's, like, inherent with comedies? Like, what is it? So, I mean, I don't think it's just one thing. I think there's a lot of factors, uh, pressure, audience pressure, network pressure, um, pressure to get more viewership than the last season, because especially now being on a streamer with, we know Netflix rolling out their advertisements soon, uh, Hulu already has advertisements, um, Amazon like might not have advertisements in there, but like there's like little clickable ads if you're on the website on like the sidebars. Like they want to make money, is what I'm trying to say. So how do we make money? Um, I think the easy answer is to do something more bombastic and crazier than prior, and that's like easy to do with comedy on paper because oh okay, well let's just put them in even in an even zanier situation, and we have more money in the bank now from last season, so maybe we can have. To, you know, to reference the earlier what we do in the shadows, which I think is very similar to Cobra Kai in regards to the trajectory that they're both on right now. Let's have them go to Vegas and act nuts and crazy because we can afford that now. All right. Sometimes it works. That Vegas thing was hilarious. But I don't know if this Mexico road trip that Miguel's on again, only after seeing two episodes and, and, and having Johnny and his son just like reconnect it, it's just almost too serious. Yeah. It's not Cobra Kai enough. It's it's a yeah. little too hallmarky because it's not mature enough to resonate, I think, on a deep level. Because I just don't think they're the kind of writers. Right. Or at least this show doesn't put them in that headspace to be mature enough in the way they want to be. So they're mature in a way that like is so 2 p.m., moms on a thursday watching hallmark right i don't know it's just like well it's funny that you mentioned that because i'm noticing that this season in particular is kind of following a similar trajectory that that we saw back in my previous least favorite season which was season two of the show where i thought season one had this really amazing balance of like i didn't think it was like super corny but i thought like kind of getting us back into the cobra kai karate kid world introducing us to this different perspective that we may not have thought of before you know and they were they, they had the silly moments for sure but like they weren't like depending on them so like it had like a halfway semi-serious tone and then season two
two was where they started to bring in the silliness, but that season started from like a place of uber seriousness, you know, like Miguel and his friends were now like no longer the nerds, but they were kind of like in their hot shit phase, you know, and you had this like kind of building romance slash tension with with uh Machio's daughter and Rob and um and Robbie and that was and, and you know and we were starting to like kind of build out the tensions and all that and it I, I in in hindsight the, my my thing with season two is that I think it perfectly synchronistically built to that final fight which from what I've heard about this finale which we both have not gotten to yet I've heard that it's gonna get to this ridiculous thing that's gonna end the season which I'm like okay if we if we can end on a ridiculous note then uh, that I'm back in you know but I, I I'm finding it to be very similar to that where it's like okay we kind of had the fun and games phase. We had the silliness phase. You know, Kreese came in, took Cobra Kai from Johnny. Then uh, Johnny teamed up with Miguel after the, they were finally able to put their differences aside. And they realized Kreese is a maniac. Then Kreese brings in Silver. Silver usurps Kreese. This shit is literally a soap opera at this point. Like, the, the, there's it, so much yeah. crazy shit going well, on. Well, that's what the CW has always been, right? right? Like Arrow, The Flash. It's just soap operas, but for, like, young boys instead of, like, young girls. It's just, like, their way to, like... Oh, we can tell this type of story to uh, right. you know a predominantly male audience too. We just need to put guys in capes in it. Yeah. It's it's and, all the same thing. Oh yeah, but like my whole thing is like, man, Thomas Ian Griffin in that last season again coming off the worst Karate Kid movie made, which is like <laughs> Karate Kid Three is like it's literally it, that's not that movie's not even like a, that movie's literally a comedy and that it's so bad it's good. That is one of the worst movies ever made. That movie is so crazy that I don't even I don't know if we got onto this in the last podcast. But Ralph Macchio, fun fact in real life, is a full year older than Thomas Ian Griffin, the guy who plays. Terry Silver, which is stop. I swear to God, swear to God, look it up. That's look crazy. It up. Machio, that I gotta say, dude, whatever Aging he's amazingly doing, amazingly well, like a fine is, wine. Yeah, yeah, it's like all Man, those all those shifty. kids who are in the outs, uh, uh, the outsiders. Yeah. They like something, something maybe, happened maybe, on that. Maybe, set. maybe it was all of them, man. Because every single one of them, you know, every yeah. single one of them, you know. So, um, I mean, we haven't seen see Tom Tal in a while. <laughs> Patrick Swayze unfortunately passed, but like we know Tom Cruise, we know Rob Lowe. We both uh, famously always say that they, they don't all age. Look great, I mean, they for their age. Great. Yeah. Um, but hold up, though. I don't want to get too far from the yeah, point because yeah. you're raising great points, and I know it's been a while. We're having fun, but I do want to be serious about one thing. Here's the problem. I think the kids matured, but they didn't han- handle it quick enough. And so it feels like they're younger in their minds than they are. They're getting older. Uh, Miguel does not look like a little kid anymore. No, um, none of them do. And it's, but, but he's still in this, like, I have to call my mom at home to check in. And, and we're like, dude, you're 23. Like, what are you doing right, here? Right. You're an adult. You can go find your father if you want. It might not be the smartest decision. It definitely is dangerous. But you can go and be on that journey on your own. I understand the mother being worried at home, but th- there seems to be a disconnect into where the kids are at mentally and to where they were trying to write them and to like where they're where they just were last season, which isn't that much time. We picked kind of right up where we left off of. And also another thing, I think. The bringing in the old Karate Kid character for the season is getting old, unfortunately. Yeah, um, kind of. That is kind of becoming. Now it's getting to the point where it's like we're bringing in characters that we don't even remember were in the Karate Kid. Like there's this one episode where uh, Daniel's wife ends up meeting up with an old friend of hers who turns out to be like Daniel's fling in the Karate Kid three, who apparently was the one that hooked them up so that they she could like express it like, oh, how dangerous Silver is and all that. And there's even more flashbacks that you know the the, the thing that they love doing, which is ripping footage from the old movies and and editing it. In into the show and i'm like okay that's that's starting to get a little bit old you know it yeah. started to get up there and, well real uh, quick owen's in the chat he wants to know if we're reading the chat not only are we re- reading the chat we're reading your message right now man thanks for being here good morning to you now i just want to say like if you're just popping in here we are cobra kai fans but we're going to be honest about how we feel about this season so As we far. are with everything we're you're only ever going to get honesty here at talking tv so just be ready for that so it might not be all singing its praises, but we do come from a place of, if you go back and watch our previous content, we do enjoy this show. Oh, yeah. Anyways, Dom, I think, yeah, it seems like we're on the same page. I don't know. I just, I feel confused because I, I like the idea of grabbing for more maturity on paper, but the way they did it is not necessarily the way that I think stays true to the voice of the show. Because I think you can have like that, CW ish type. Okay, we're going to try and do something a little more deep, but still keep that like soap opera for fists and punches thing going. Right. 
but I really think we're seeing the uh, creative team be stretched uh, yeah. like far they have past this con- what they're like, capable of, unfortunately. Like, like, they have this confrontation at this water park, and I'm like, okay, like, all of you guys look like you're, like, 25. Like, come on. What 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 is going on here? Like, this is getting ridiculous, you know? Um, Great point, because we're past the... That's what I'm trying to say. Like, Miguel yeah. looks too old. Like, like we're past all, the point Miguel, of fighting like Miguel, in public without... Miguel, Robbie, Tori, um, Hawk, all those guys are now... Like, they, when we started, those guys were, like, you know, between, like... 18, 19, 20, you know, so they were like still able to pass as like younger kids, you know, all that. Now they're like 23, 24. Like I, I think the the girl who plays Sam is 26. Like, come on, guys. Like, it, it, and like again, it's inevitable. It happens with every single one of these shows that's about teenagers. Every single show in the history of DCW has dealt with that. That's why they always have to deal with them later on in high school and graduating. Granted, the 2000 era, that's a different story because people, because I've looked at pictures, people literally look like they were 35 in high school and they were 17. So that, at the very least, is not super out of the ordinary. You know, people like look in general younger now. But yeah, it's getting to the point where We've seen all these tricks. We've seen all these traits before from the kids. Now, as far as the older generation goes, you know, this is one where I I, I don't know, man. It's just like, look, the appeal of it was always just seeing just Johnny Lawrence trying to be like a regular uh, person in society and always kind of seeing him fail. That was always kind of the goofiness. And that's kind of what always brought him back to Cobra Kai. And I'll admit that this season, seeing Johnny try and be a responsible dad, I don't know. Like, there's still some great Zabka moments in here because Zabka is, again, he's the reason to watch this show. But I don't know, man. It just seems like, again, like Johnny trying to learn to be a better dad and all that. Like, I'll, I won't spoil anything, but I'll say they have a reason for that coming up. But yeah, okay. I understand. Like... I think it's cool. He's one whose journey feels warranted because we've slowly watched it grow and develop. Whereas I feel now we're we're just like Daniel Russo has gone so far off the deep end. Yeah, and his man. arc just feels so unjustified. He's bringing in anyone and everyone, pretty much a perfect stranger into his house, someone he hasn't known since he was a little kid, just right. because it's they like, trained oh, I, in I Okinawa reconnect, together. I reconnected mean... with him like a couple years ago. So right, just just because you trained with someone forty years ago doesn't mean that they didn't go on to become like a psychopath serial killer who you're just letting in your house walk around naked for that matter with your kids around. And I love how that wasn't the wife's concern either. Right. It's like, it's like, Oh yeah. Daniel is- Russo, who has consistently been the voice of reason since minute one of this show. Again, the audience avatar of calling out. Yeah, this shit is stupid. You guys have got to stop with this karate conflict nonsense. And now even she's in on it. Yeah. And, and so it's just like, everyone's gone off the deep end but johnny and i gotta say man if 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 there is like more seasons after this one and they keep fighting in public i want like mug shots like for i want real. there to for we real. have to they, start they... introducing like parole officer characters because these kids look way too old to be fighting in public and not having consequences come their way like we need to have like uh oh sam's sam's just getting out of jail like some shameless type stuff like if she fights again in public with cobra kai she could go to jail but they're disrespecting her honor and she's not too worried about her rap sheet because it's only this long and she can make it this long before and she besides, has to really are, worry like besides her parents are rich we all know that she wouldn't get a rap sheet to begin with but dude yeah they it's, chucked, it's just for, for, dude fuck regular jail they chucked a kid through a window how are any of these guys not in juvie like i mean it's the thing that double toasted has been making fun of since day one like they are clearly in a fantasy world where they can just have these karate tournaments all over the valley and the most that they can do is just have you know the the one wife character just be the audience avatar as as far as being like yeah this shit is stupid you know like it's stop fighting but yeah it's 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 ridiculous it's gotten to the point where it's like yeah how is any of this still happening in a real world setting but you know in all seriousness i think last season i'm thinking back now the last Eagle season Fangs. was so good. It was so good last season. It was so much fun. They were just so ridiculous from minute one to minute w- whatever at the end of that last episode. You know? Yeah, a hundred percent. And it was. It, but but the thing is, it felt, even though it was a fantasy world, it felt like the decisions made sense. There was a cause and an effect, consequences for actions. Like when Johnny has kids jumping across buildings. Um, okay, ridiculous. <laughs> crazy if someone saw him do this he's going to jail on the spot but sam needed to jump across that building in that moment right she needed to overcome that to go on to have the arc she does in that season and again i've only seen two episodes even though that's far-fetched though it's still grounded in their reality they're crazy where is that this season i'm not feeling that tether to some sense of normalcy which i know again is not necessarily always there in Cobra Kai, but where is that to keep me on board with fighting these Australian people for some reason who are running this stupid scam right on the side of the bus stop? 
like, like where is the where is the okay i can brush aside all that fun stuff and enjoy it because we're actually moving somewhere that makes me feel like this is worth the watch where is that right now do yeah. you have that six episodes in um kind of sort of but not really because here's the other problem from this season as well is that we have this thing that happens and i feel like game of thrones kind of started this which is where every other season is setting up for the next season and this is a setup season for sure like you could very tell very easily and obviously tell as far as where it's going that it is setting up for both the, the finale and also the sixth and more than likely final season. Because from what I've I've done some reading ahead as far as what where the rest of the season goes and what I will say from what I've read is that it is definitely setting up for another major confrontation that is going to happen in the next season, which they will more than likely will be renewed. But it definitely is getting the feeling the next season is going to be the last season, which I'm like, okay, I can at the very least excuse a couple of the flaws if they're setting us up for like this big, crazy, nutso finale. But also at the same time, it's like, yeah, it's getting to that feeling where it's like, yeah, we, we need to start wrapping this shit up. They, they are officially at the point where it's like, yeah, we know we've hit the end of our road and we can only do so much more stuff. So that that's kind of where I'm at as far as feeling where it's going because you're right those first couple episodes you're like so this is like a trip to mexico and they're like doing this like undercover mission and they're bringing in even more karate kid legacy characters you know like i said the gimmicks are getting old so and, and we kind of have come to expect we know the formula for lack of a better word so now it's kind of a matter of it's like okay like that now because we're so familiar with it it kind of works against us where it's like okay where we kind of don't know where we're going but not in an interesting satisfied way versus last season where it's like oh my god they bring back terry silver and not only is he like way like more badass than he was in karate kid 3 but it's like the Again, they're, they're doing the thing of where it's like, wow, they're making up for Karate Kid Theory. They're turning this guy to like a legitimate threat. They're like, oh, you thought John Kreese was bad. Oh, man, this guy makes him look like a like a pack of puppies to the point where he even stabs Kreese in the back and takes over Cobra Kai single-handedly. Like, oh, man, he was a force to be reckoned with. And Thomas Ian Griffin, I will say, is still an absolute joy to watch. He's probably like because he's probably replaced Zabka as far as my reason to watch the show. He's just so like abhorrently evil in a way that Kreese was almost like cartoonishly evil in a way. I don't know. Like, what's your take on that? No, I think that's a great segue into like a different topic here because, yeah, the performances are still really good. It's it's nothing against what the actors are doing. I think it's more so against what they're being given. And I think it's easy to sort of be critical on the performances because of how creatively intertwined we know that Zapka and Machio are to this show. So it's like you're putting your heart on your sleeve a little more when you are not only the person on screen being the face and the star, but also such a big part of running the show, creating the like storyline, you know, you kind of bear the brunt of a, of a less well-written season. And you also get to reap the benefits of a more strongly put together season. And I think that's why it's easier when it comes to Cobra Kai outside of it being so, you know, cheeky or um just whatever it is that vein of like sort of like lower tier soap opera style tv outside of all that it's easier to i think be harder on this because of you know just the um the nature of the what level, kind of show it is and 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 and, and how in-depth and involved the creators are and and and, and just because of how attached to it they are there, there's so many different facets where we can again sing their praises when it goes right but we can pick it apart when it goes wrong and this is just your classic example of i think you know because it's it's terry silver is is crushing it um you know ralph macchio is still interesting like i because he's given so many good performances in the past i just don't really believe where he's coming from right now and i think that um obviously johnny is johnny and he is the goat and i love him but I mean, I just don't like where anyone's going, and 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 that's that's the the performances are great. The kids, honestly, I really think have become good actors. Yeah, not they, not they, amazing. They, they've grown into their own. I, I, if you would ask me like a couple years ago, which group of kid actors was going to like really grow into their own and become like good actors between Cobra Kai and Stranger Things, and you told me that I would have picked Cobra Kai over Stranger Things, I would have said you were nuts because like my whole thing is that like the Stranger Things kids, they're all great. Like they are, they are all great actors, and they all work collectively on their own. But it's like outside of Stranger Things, like what really is their mass market appeal? You really haven't seen like a whole bunch of them break out. Versus like the Cobra Kai guys, like uh, Miguel is gonna lead to be leading the Blue Beetles movie. You know, Tanner Buchanan's got his own career going. Peyton List is a former Disney Channel star, and they usually go on to like some pretty lucrative and interesting careers. You know, the kids who play Dimitri and Hawk, they're pretty good actors in and of their own right. Even the younger yeah, actors we'll that they start, do start to bring in, yeah, like uh, like they're all like they've got like interesting uh, like appeal, and I'm actually like interested to see them as like actors and other stuff other than the show you know yeah so i don't think it's 
a fault of anyone on screen and the production still looks as it has. It's just, again, where the story's going, nothing can really save it. And the gimmick of bringing in old classic alumni right. to the franchise is getting old and we can't keep introducing new younger students because then it's like, okay, well, we introduce four to five new characters this season, then that season, if we're only doing 10 half hour ish episodes, eventually someone's plot line is going to get dropped or fall short. And I think the scope is also getting a little too big. And I think you notice this season, everyone's kind of separate, at least where I'm at right now. Yep. And why are we're they also separate? At that phase where they're separating everyone out, which happens always at least once in a show. It's easier that way. It's easier to give yourself, bide yourself some time. Okay, we, if we can separate these guys, we know their stories are connected. So we can isolate them so then we don't show the viewers over here how we didn't really think that these guys and these guys would ever come together. We were just kind of trying to make that season work. And now we're screwed because we have all these characters and all these moving pieces. And how do we make it work? And I feel like that's where we're at. You know? Yeah, no, I agree. I will say there's a couple of good things that I do like. I like, um, you know, Johnny kind of because a, a big arc that has been throughout the consistent show is Johnny kind of as trying to be this father frig figure to Miguel, who has never really had that. While also, you know, kind of neglecting his own actual son Robbie, which is kind of why Daniel was able to step in. You know, and obviously everything that happened there happened. But now the fact that Johnny's like kind of accepting both Robbie and Miguel as his own and trying to have them make up, I think is really interesting. Also, I will say that Tori. After last season, kind of, you know, once realizing what Silver did in order to ensure that she won the tournament, she's going through a little bit of a crisis of faith in and of herself and realizing that she's not getting from Silver the same kind of relationship that she had with Kreese. Uh, a couple of other things that I think are interesting is I think that, surprisingly, after what we thought that, like, Sam was going to be going through, like, a heel turn last season, I think is, like, starting to, like, acknowledge it a little bit more. But she definitely does have that thing where it's like, oh, I need to time away from Miguel, which I'm like, oh, okay, really? We're still doing this in, in stories? Okay, that that that's still a thing. All right. My, my only real like kind of nitpick with the characters this season is gross under usage of both Hawk and Dimitri. Dimitri is barely in this season at all after arguably his best two seasons yet, season three and four. And Hawk, who had probably the gr the best arc of the last couple seasons, finally coming out of his evil phase, becoming the badass that he is, getting what he thought the source of his power was, shaved off his mohawk, and then, you know, coming out and winning the tournament against uh, Robbie, you know. And the, the gross under usage of those who have quickly become like two of my favorite characters in the, in the whole show. I, I will say that. Does Dimitri get that summer job? Uh, I'll, I'll say that like he's kind of only used very sparingly is, is uh, what I'm going to say. It's a shame. And that I I think speaks to the problem. I think that speaks to the problem that I was just kind of trying to allude to. Right. They just put too much on their plate and you can't change the structure of the format of a show. The audience is trained. We know we're getting 10 half hour ish episodes once, maybe twice a year at the start and the end. Right. Like that's what we know now. It's been established. But it sucks when some real characters that you've loved and have been mainstays on the show fall short. I, I have been thinking, and it's only been two episodes, but where the hell are these guys that are some of my favorite characters? Dimitri, Hawk, come on now. This yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, th th and I think the problem is also they, they, they shoot themselves in the foot by introducing new younger characters who I think are all interesting. Yeah. But it just also at the same time, while I think they did a good job getting us to where we are, now I feel like they only thought so far ahead. Yeah. And it sucks. They're also making the the criminal mistake of, again, emphasizing absolutely <laughs> terrible characters over the characters that we actually like, a.k.a. Daniel's son, um, who is just, he's on the level of, um, what's it called, uh, you, you know, the fucking, the kids who are now grown up on For All Mankind, um, what's it called, Gordo and Tracy's kids on For All Mankind, who are now adults in this past season, and those two just became, like, two of the worst characters on that entire show, one of whom joined an anarchist group, one of whom caused an explosion on Mars, just, just caused, like, those two are, like, the worst characters, and Daniel's son, I can't even remember his name because that's how awful of a character he is, he only had one good moment in the entire show and in his entire history of the show where last season he ends up talking to Robbie and Robbie's like and Robbie kind of, uh, not Robbie he ends up talking to Zabka and Zabka kind of makes a, a crack where it's like wait who are you and he's like I'm his son and he's like oh my god you've grown that much it's like it's weird and he's kind of like making a joke about like how fast kids grow and like we see them grow up on a tv show and like I don't think he was in like that one season I was like his only bit and now and now like consider the fact that he essentially like caused one of these new characters to go into Cobra Kai. And I'm like, oh, great. So we're spending more time with that character. Great. We're still doing this. Awesome. 
Yeah, I don't know what else to really say about it. It's I think time will tell, right? I hope yeah. that we are nearing the end because I don't think so far yeah. we've gone too far off the rails. And when I say nearing the end, I mean of this Cobra Kai experience, experiment, if you will. Like, I don't think we've gone too far off the rails right. of saving this ship. And I don't even think it's a sinking ship yet, but I do think we're starting to see problems, right? We're starting to see p- holes poked into the side of the vehicle, uh, into the side of the boat. We're taking on some water. Can we can we patch those up before this thing sinks? Because I'd like to. Yeah. I'd like to be able to go back one day and be like, oh, it's been a few years since I watched Cobra Kai. Was it as good as I remember? I'd love to answer that question as yes, because I yeah. don't know if I can most of the time. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. So with that being said, like I said, I wanted to talk about a couple other things with you. For right now, we're going to wrap up our conversation on Cobra Kai. I'm going to give this season so far, like I said, I've only seen six episodes. So I'll give a more complete rating on my serialized page. Be sure to check that out once you guys get the chance um, later on. But for right now, I'm giving this season a three and a half out of five. It's still good. It's not like nearly as bad as some other Netflix crap that I've watched in the last couple of years. Some other returning seasons of Netflix shows that I thought did not uh, hold up to uh, you know what the last season did, <laughs> Umbrella Academy. But um, yeah, I, I'm giving this se- this season so far three and a half out of five. Sure, yeah, understandable. So me guys again, only seeing two episodes. I'm gonna give it a three out of five. I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. Like I said, there's a lot that I liked, but unfortunately, there's a lot I didn't like. And this is the first time I've. I mean, we've really yeah. haven't we've been covering the, the show moon. really since the beginning, like since it dropped on Netflix back in 2020. You know, this, and this is the first a staple of the, of the of the talking TV channel. And this is the first time we've covered it in this kind of air of yeah. nervousness, of doubt, which is weird. So yeah. we'll see. Yeah. So, Chris, I wanted to take this time. Like I said, it's been a little bit, so we haven't gotten a chance to talk about some of the newer stuff. You know, like I said, you're still catching up on a lot of the stuff. I wanted to see what shows you're watching right now, but also I wanted to catch up on some things that are airing right now that I'm watching. So first off, House of the Dragon on HBO. Have you heard anything about it? Have you been keeping track of like kind of the stuff surrounding it? No, at this point, I'm just going to give myself I have a winter break coming up in about, I think, the week before it it, it wraps. So I'm just going to do a nice little binge that week. I will say, for my money at least, I am, especially, again, going in after the last season of Game of Thrones, obviously it left the taste in our mouth. Pat and I actually, we just wrapped up recording our Talking Thrones recap series, and we're airing the final season right now on the show. Episode 1 is already out. Episode 2 will be out this coming Friday, so be sure to stay tuned for that. I think... If, if I'm not, bra- if it's not a humble brag, it might be some of the greatest podcasting work that Pat and I have ever done. Like this, oh man, I don't know if you've been seeing the TikToks that we've so been dropping. Can I but just? We've been cr- he's been crushing it. Shout out to Professor Pat for sticking through with me all 73 episodes of Game of Thrones, never wavering yeah. for a bit. Shout can out to Pat. He's a real what one. was that like, man? It was oh, a journey. It was awesome. It was it was definitely a journey for minute one. There were a lot of changes that happened. Obviously, we started that still during the COVID age. Um, you know, we were streaming it live to the channel. Then we just we weren't. I'll be honest, we weren't getting the views that we wanted. So we ended up kind of pulling it back, only putting it on audio form. We took a month long break at Christmas. We came back strong with season four, and we recorded all the way through up until the summer. Throughout the summer, we started batching the episodes because we just we wanted to get it over with. And I think that batching the episodes, recording multiple episodes a week, ended up being like the best possible thing because once we got to the last two seasons, season seven and eight, we were just powering through each episode. And we knew that we wanted like exactly what we wanted to say. And it essentially, it was kind of therapeutic for me because the whole thing is that when Game of Thrones final season aired, it felt like it came and went so quickly that I didn't really have a chance to like give the reaction and discourse at the time that I wanted. And then the pandemic came in and like it was even more so forgotten. And then kind of, you know, House of the Dragon and Martin starting to make a little bit more of a comeback gave us kind of the opportunity that we wanted to kind of talk about the show, talk about what went wrong, talk about everything that happened throughout the course of the show. And I think we did that. And I think we did that in the best possible way. I, for me at least, for my money at least, and I'm not just saying that, because I was on the show, I think it's the best Game of Thrones recap show like ever, personally. All right, so Dom, I yeah. feel like I know you pretty well as a friend right, and a critic. I would think so, yeah. Do you feel that you have said everything you need to say about Game of Thrones, or do you think there's still something left that you might... I mean, look, we're talking about me. <laughs> I'm always going to find more stuff to say about things because that's right. just me. But as far as just getting it all out of my system, all the stuff that I've kind of been holding inside it since 2019, some of the, you know, some of the things that I wanted to say but couldn't just because I didn't really have like kind of the presence that I did back in 2019 that I do now, I definitely think I've gotten it all out of my system. Be like, okay, I've understood. I've come to accept what it is, both the good and and the bad. I understand that that final season is flawed. I understand that there's problems with the last four seasons that I under, but I've come to again, understand that there is a distinction. There is a distinct cutoff where Martin's Game of Thrones becomes Benioff and Weiss's Game of Thrones. And like I said, there's good and there's bad 
in Benioff and Weiss's Game of Thrones. Obviously, it's not as consistent and solid as Martin's, but there is still good to be had there. And I've come to accept it for what it is, is, is my whole thing. You know, like I said, there are still moments that I absolutely hate. Season five is still one of the worst things I've ever seen, aside from Hard Home. But the final season, like I said, I've come to accept it. You know, I've, 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 I've managed to glean that part of my life out of it. You know, and I've come to accept that Game of Thrones will always be one of my favorite shows. You know, and as far as House of the Dragon, how that translates to that. The biggest thing for me that was surprising is that I didn't realize just how involved Martin was going to be in the show. Because the big thing they said is, you know, it's Miguel Sapochnik, who was the director of all the great action sequence set piece episodes that came in the last couple of seasons. You know, directed Hard Home, Battle of the Bastards, Winds of Winter, and then The Long Night in the Bells for the last season. And... Um, and then this other guy, Ryan Condal, but I wasn't sure exactly what Martin's involvement was going to be. And you can imagine my surprise where Martin is very fully involved and you could tell that like they are really, really trying to go out of their way to make this like the, like Martin's work and not deviate from it the way that Benioff and Weiss did in the last couple seasons. And I think Eric Thorpe, you know, resident Game of Thrones had gave, gave probably the best criticism that I've seen of that show, which is that it's the it's season one's level of writing with season eight production value. And I think that's the absolute best way that I can summarize it, where, again, it is very fastidious. It is very long. It is very drawn out. You know, they're covering a lot in a lot of periods of time, you know, and it's also it's a very different kind of a show than Game of Thrones. You know, Game of Thrones was this political struggle with this kind of over looming, like existential dread that kind of built itself up into this high fantasy in a way that we've never really seen before. In a sense, like kind of the opposite side of the coin of Lord of the Rings, you know, getting into like a lot more of like the characters being more morally gray. They're not really being the sense of right and wrong, good and evil. And this show, I'll say, is more much more so a succession really than a Game of Thrones where it's much more of a Shakespearean tragedy about, you know, kind of this family and kind of how, again, the grapples and dealings with their political um, standing is constantly at the detriment to their family, you know, where you have this, uh, you know, this divide between the current King Viserys, his daughter, Rhaenyra, uh, Rhaenyra, and his brother, Daemon, as well as all the other figures that are kind of in the high court, you know, trying to stake their claim, you know, uh, his hand, uh, his his master of ships, all that. And it's it, it's really interesting. I love the budget. I love the production value. And it, it's just, it's good TV. It's really good TV. You know, it's kind of an, I'm not exactly going to say that it's like what Better Call Saul was to Breaking Bad, but it's almost at that level. You know, I'm three episodes in and I'm loving every minute of it I, I was not at all expecting to enjoy it as much as I did but I heavily heavily recommend it definitely more so over these other two shows that I'm about to talk about because and I well, real wanna... quick real quick yeah. real quick before we dive into um these other two shows I, I do want to know someone who has seen Game of Thrones twice yeah. but it's been a while right yeah. it's been a while since I've watched the show do I need to do a refresher or will this when I put this first episode on because you're selling me on it I might toss it on at some point today in between working on school yeah. and, and it's stuff. only three like, episodes out so you could easily catch up on it before the new episode airs tonight like will i be out of the loop i don't think so personally i really don't think so i mean obviously again it's gonna have that thing of every prequel that every prequel has where obviously you're gonna have a better understanding and better appreciation for it if you've watched it but for my money like again this this show takes place all, all i think the opening frame of the show is it's literally 100 says 172 years before daenerys targaryen comes to westeros you know like this is literally about her ancestry so like there's no real i mean obviously there's references there's certain characters that have the same last name but like there's no character in the show that you're like you're not going to see Maester Aemon pop up. You're not going to see like any of the old characters. It's hundreds of years before any of them were even born, you know. So me personally, I don't think that anybody watching the show will be lost. The biggest criticism that I've heard is that oh, it's too slow compared to Game of Thrones, which again is what made us fall in love with those first couple seasons of Game of Thrones before it kind of turned into this fast-paced, fast-moving action blockbuster the last couple seasons. All right, good to know. Good to know. Yeah, I'll keep yeah, you no. guys posted, and you posted as well. As I, uh, yeah, please do. I really that on show of all list. the shows is the one that I'm really interested. In. Now, I want to talk about Lord of the Rings for a hot minute. I talked about it last week, obviously on the podcast with Eli. We kind of broke down. Like I said, Eli's the big super Tolkien head, so obviously I wanted to get his perspective. But I'll say I watched the first two episodes. I'm going to watch the third episode at some point. And what I'll say for my money is. I think this is the one where I'm the most conflicted on because Amazon is once again showing just how absolutely petty they are because they literally started airing the show a week after House of the Dragon and they're kind of bookending each week. And I'm like, oh my God, Amazon, you are so friggin' petty. And what I will say is this is, as far as like kind of, you know, their fantasy shows that they are just putting literally all the money into, you know, Lord of the Rings is probably, I think, the most expensive television show ever made. I think they put like $750 million into this first season alone. Like, it's ridiculous ridiculous number and i'll say that the money is definitely showing as the as, as far as the effects go and the biggest criticism towards this show has been that it feels like a lord of the rings cheap copy rather at least as far as from normies go rather than you know if you want to ignore all the woke backlash and all the different stuff that again that just amazon is using in its favor in order to kind of promote the show and everything for my money at least it was 
I think it was interesting because my whole thing is it's been so long since I've been in the realm of Middle Earth because I didn't watch any of the Hobbit movies and never had any desire to that I'll say that kind of them making it this more episodic story that's slowly unfolding. There's certainly there's elements I think that don't work. But for my money, I was actually very interested and I'm actually kind of interested in where they're going, especially seeing how unlike House of the Dragon, this is very much so going to build into the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings because the what was so interesting about kind of Tolkien's works in general, and again, I know every Tolkien reader is going to hate me for this because they said they didn't get it exactly right, is that Tolkien literally kind of envisioned this whole world and backstory in the creation of the ring in order to create this foundation for Lord of the Rings. And now that we're actually getting to, like, that was always kind of a micro nitpick that I had with Lord of the Rings, where it's like, okay, we have all this backstory that's given to us about the one ring, but all that stuff sounds so interesting and I kind of want to see it. And so it always felt like there was like a lot of stuff that was missing from the stuff that I was seeing in Lord of the Rings. Like there's so much lore, so much mystery and so much backstory. And now we're actually getting that. And even though, again, it's not exactly like how it happened in the Silmarillion, like I said, it's adapted from the Silmarillion. It's based off the stuff going on in the second age. It's still interesting for me, you know, and I'm still interested to see where it goes. It kind of, you know, so that's why I can't recommend it as much as I recommend House of the Dragon, but for my money, it's still interesting, which is something that I can't at all say about The Hobbit, which is something that, again, should have been one movie, should have been one really awesome movie, and they stretched it out into three movies that ended up kind of wrecking it and destroying it. So I'll say that, again, if you don't hate Lord of the Rings, I don't think it's a must-watch, especially since it already seems like kind of the air has already gone out of it, because again, they, I feel like they kind of shot themselves in the foot again, where as far as depending on all the woke backlash in order to try and promote the show, and now everybody's moved on, which is what happens every single time with this. Yeah, I'm gonna watch it. I just... I was never the craziest about Lord of the Rings. I always loved it. Thought it was awesome. Right. But it always um, felt like just those self-contained three movies. And it didn't feel like it needed to go on past that. And so the idea of them going into the lore. But that's where I'll say I'm surprised is that I didn't think I was going to have any more interest for Lord of the Rings. But I'm actually very interested. And I will say that I thought that the gimmick of like, oh, it's young Galadriel, it's young Elrond. I thought that was going to be annoying. And it so far, surprisingly, has not been. At least for me. You know, I've made my peace with everything must have a now um, larger cinematic universe with a plethora of content associated with it, even if I disagree. That's not my issue here. My issue here isn't the wokeisms or whatever. I've I've read articles and I've seen whatever. It just just whatever. But I think my real issue is can it live up to those movies? And I, that's yeah. why I'm afraid to dive and in. I, I'm excited right. to get back to Middle Earth. I miss it. I, I, you know, I always wanted more, but I thought that was the beauty of the movie is is the letting my young mind, a little kid mind who, right. who loved those movies, just imagine what it was like right. out there in Mordor past what I had seen. I don't and, know and if I actually they, need to see it. What I'll say is they don't, I'll say for my money at least, I don't, I mean, obviously again, it's like we, we Middle Earth has just such this distinct look that was established by those movies. But for my money, at least, I personally do not feel from this show, from these two episodes that I've seen, that they are trying to emulate Jackson. The show feels like its own thing while you still feel like you're in Middle Earth. And like I said, the other thing that helps you is you're seeing a lot of different regions of Middle Earth that you didn't see in those movies. But like I said, that that's going to be like a case-by-case -case basis for person. So you'll have to let me know once you actually watch that to see if you get that feeling. If, 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 um, Again, if it can hold up, because you're right. Like I said, we even talked about this again for I feel like for a lot of people that are not like the diehard Tolkien fans, it's that Lord of the Rings was just those three movies. And it feels like because they hit those three movies so hard, it's like there was never really and Return of the King was literally the ending to define all endings. It never felt like there was a reason to kind of go back and explore more of that world, you know. And so that's kind of what's going to be interesting for me going forward is exploring this different sect, you know, because it is very much a prequel. And now the last show, I have to talk about it. She-Hulk, man. I I, I got to talk about it for a bit, mostly just because, just in order to get you, you know, I, I haven't made a Facebook post in a while, but I did recently for this show because Marvel, right. as we know, has just been like, they, they've been on such a downward spiral this year. Like I said, we covered a lot of their stuff last year, and for the most part, like I said, we, we could kind of see the writing on the wall as far as where it was going, and 2022 is just the self-actualized realization where everybody is, for the most part, is just very disgruntled, very not happy with what they're getting. Like I said, Multiverse of Madness has gotten you know what it was. Love and Thunder was all but critically reviled completely. Uh, Miss Marvel, I didn't even bother to watch. Moon Knight's really the only thing that I've enjoyed from them. Even I had problems with them, but I started watching She-Hulk. Because it came out a day after my birthday. So naturally, I had to watch it. And obviously, again, it's another thing of where it's like, okay, all of the, you know, all the usual uh, tropes, problems, all the above are there as far as with Marvel and where it goes. 
But I started watching She-Hulk the first episode. And this is the first time that Marvel has tried to like essentially like apply like a television approach where it's like, oh, it's more so just hanging out with your favorite characters each week. There's not really an underlying plot that's driving the trajectory of the show. It's more so the uh, I, I, the, the best way that I can pitch the show is it's literally like, oh, She-Hulk trying to get a date because she can't get a man and all, all that usual nonsense. And I can safely say that this is the worst thing that Marvel has ever made. Oh, my God. Every single thing that we thought was bad for them last year, this takes the cake. It is the single worst, most garbage thing the creators and writers have actively talked behind the scenes about how little thing they actually had, how there essentially is no plot, no story that they have to work with. Chris, the CG in this show, it is somehow worse than in the trailer. The last episode literally had her twerking with Megan Thee Stallion. That is actually the stuff that is happening in this show. This is the single worst thing that Marvel has ever put out. But but there is one caveat to that. There's one caveat to that. And I feel like only I can have this opinion because this is literally what I posted on my Facebook. I said, this is literally the worst show I've ever seen and I can't stop watching because it's one of those things where it's almost to the point of so bad it's good because I think Marvel under because I think what happened was is Marvel and Disney Plus understood that they had a bomb on their hands and doing what they usually do they are just running with it and I I'm having a blast watching this show. It is this is the first show in a while where I'm like this show fucking sucks every single week and I'm having so much fun watching it. It is so bad and it is entertaining. That is all that I can say about it. And literally and just to read you some of the comments on it. Uh literally one of my friends commented uh was it, just jokingly is like why do you hate women so much? And the other thing that one of my other friends commented was see this is an opinion I can trust and I'm like I still got it. I still got it. Oh God! So basically, this is a show that I'll never watch. I, I don't want watch, anything but... that comes along with what you're saying. I oh, don't want just, any part of it. It's So stupid, though. It's so I'm, I'm giving this show a <sighs> shout out. I'm and again for everything. Are bad, you gonna stick with it? Oh yeah, I have to. I'm too far in at this point. I'm four episodes and I have to at this point. Well, because think about it this way: every everything that Disney has given us so far this year, Book of Boba, Obi Wan, Miss Marvel, it's just been bad it hasn't been it, it isn't even like the semi good with some good stuff but like for the most part just kind of inconsistent with like the stuff that we got last year or the last couple of years you know everything we've gotten this year with the exception of moon knight has just been awful book of boba fett sucked obi-wan i couldn't even finish miss marvel didn't even want to watch but this is the first thing that i've seen from them where it's like okay it sucks but at the very least, it's entertaining. And what I will say, though, is I, I'm hoping that this is going to be the last thing that we get from them that's bad. Because the next slate that they've got coming out, you know, between the stuff that we know that's coming out for the rest of the year and or and then their batch of slate that they release next year. But I'll say this. they uh, Yesterday was D23 and they just released their um, what's it called their trailers for some of the stuff that's coming out. And I got to say between uh, Star Wars and Marvel, Mando season three and Secret Invasion won't know how those shows actually go. But as far as based off those trailers, those shows both look fantastic. Like Mando season three looks unbelievable secret invasion looks unbelievable and or i even said it from the beginning that trailer is like one of the best trailers that i've seen in a while I'm so looking like forward to Andor. hopefully this is the end of like kind of that crappy you know kind of not really being able to do anything because of pandemic time and we can actually start to get back to some good stuff i'm hoping you know one could hope uh, I don't know quite what else to really. Yeah, it's Disney, so who really knows? But like, like I said, I, I swear to God, like this whole this whole last episode was literally a court case involving a magician sending a drunk, as I call it, a woo girl from How I Met Your Mother to Wong, and Wong attempting to serve him a cease and desist. That is actually stuff that is happening on this show. I I, I wish I was making this stuff up. I really do. And the next episode they're bringing in Daredevil, and I'm like, look, everyone's so excited to see Daredevil back. He's coming back in Echo, and he's getting his own show. They got. Charlie Cox back from Netflix and we get to see him in this crap wonderful like oh man yeah yeah it, I don't know I'm glad that I have to pick and choose my battles based on my schedule this day and age <laughs> yeah for real for real and like unfortunately I'm also I'm so sad because stress. They, they delayed Bad Batch again it's now not coming out until January 4th which is annoying but a hey, great way to start the new year, though. Yeah, great way to start a new year. Like I said, as far as some of the other Marvel announcements that were made, um, the biggest thing I think that came out of D23, unlike Comic-Con, is that the leader from The Incredible Hulk is coming back and is going to be the villain in the next Captain America movie. We officially have the Thunderbolt slate and still nothing on Fantastic Four, which I thought other than the 
director. They recently, so John Watts, who was the director of the Spider-Man movies, was originally slated to direct Fantastic Four, and he stepped away. So now they have the director of WandaVision, who I thought actually did a really good job directing that show, Matt Shackman directing Fantastic Four. So we'll see how that goes. Like I said, it's just the gluttony of Marvel content. I am definitely, specifically next year in 2023, going to be picking and choosing my Marvel battles for sure. Um, but yeah, that's really it. That, that's pretty much everything that's going on in the world of pop culture. We'll keep you guys updated as the rest of the year goes on. Like I said, we got another big returning show next week. We have the return of the final season of Atlanta next week. We've also got, like I said, we're officially, summer's over, so we're officially in fall movie season. And I will say, this is the first fall in a while where I've actually had like, okay, we've actually, we got some movies to look forward to, you know? So in two weeks, we're going to be kicking off the fall movie season, building up to Oscars with the very controversial, don't worry, darling. I cannot wait to cover that movie just based off all the stupid drama that's happening behind the scenes. Did Harry Styles spit on Chris Pine or Olivia Wilde and Florence Pugh feuding? Who knows? But it's all going to be covered right here on the Talking TV podcast, Chris. It's great to have you back, man. Where can the good people follow you on the interwebs? Yeah, no, guys, uh, nothing's changed. Even though a lot has changed, uh, my handles remain the same. Uh, you can find me at Christian Ivanko, E V A N K O. I make music, which you can find through the links in my bio. I'd very much appreciate you listening. It's on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, Google, and a whole other plethora of streaming services, as well as I make content here. So please, of course, follow the podcast and my co host, Dom. Where can they find you, man? At Movie Nerd Reviews across all platforms. Be sure to follow the official Talking TV podcast across all platforms. We go live once a week on Sunday. Like I said, now that Talking Thrones is coming to an end, we will definitely have some more content for you guys coming out. Like I said, I've got a couple things that I've been working on behind the scenes as well that I just haven't had time to finish because of the move. But the third annual Talking TVs will be out within the next couple of weeks, probably sometime around closer to the Emmys. The Emmys are actually airing uh, tomorrow night. But I will be sure to get that out sometime as well. And as well, I also did a Kubrick rewatch over the summer, of which I'm doing a video for that I'm very, very much looking forward to. So be sure to stay tuned to that. And also be sure to stay tuned to our TikTok. I, I'm going super hard on that. And I, I I will say that, like I said, people seem to like our content. I've started posting some clips from Talking Thrones on there. Some very entertaining stuff. If you like Professor Pat's dry sense of humor, I would heavily, heavily recommend going on and watching that for sure. All of that. At our handles, at official talking TV podcast across all platforms. You should subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitch. New episodes are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts every single Monday. And as always, people, you know what I'm going to say 12 seasons of short film and watch more fucking movies. Welcome to the fall. <laughs>